niggas don't think shit, stink pink gators. My Detroit players, Tim's for my hooligans in Brooklyn. What's up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Business and Biceps. And it's Monday, and you better wake your ass up. And this is episode Deuce Deuce, number 22 on today's show. Can you speak? Can you speak things into reality? We're going to talk about two of the most polarizing figures in today's just world that are speaking some craziness into reality that both of you guys know. John and I are going to weigh in, and we are just excited about this topic because when you can back up confidence in just delivery, man, there's some, there's some amazing things that can happen. And so I want to bring in my co-host. John Fosco, but before I do that, this is brought to you by MaxEffortMuscle.com in Reebok. You better be more human. John Fosco, what's going on? Corey, I'm in the house, brother. Listen, I, um, I'm very excited about this topic because the two figures, we'll let the cat out of the bag that we're referring <laughs> to, are our new president-elect, uh, Donald Trump, and um, the man who has taken mixed martial arts in the UFC to uh, levels that people probably never thought uh, the UFC would go to, and that's Conor McGregor. Both of these two guys have done things that if you were to bet on it, let's say two or three years ago, the odds would be like a million to one. They are both guys who achieve things that seem almost supernatural but continue to do it and build on it so dude once we get into this and break it down i i think we're going to have some different perspectives i think we're going to have some same perspectives but here's the cool part i think there's going to be a huge number of takeaways that our listeners can grab onto and just take pieces from these guys because you may like them you may hate them but you cannot deny that they win and i think that's what we're all trying to do core yeah you can't deny they're winning that's for damn sure because they both are (laughs) now so john i'm just going to ask you straight up to start this thing going do you believe in that you know the secret book the think and grow rich the speaking things into reality the uh visualization like do you truly believe in in that kind of phenomenon i think yes and no um I'll say, uh, we'll go with the no part. Okay. No, if you have no, let's say, charisma yep. or no athletic talent and you think you're going to be a Donald Trump or a Conor McGregor, I think you need to be self-aware enough to know yourself and yep. know what your skills and gifts are and then you can take those skills and gifts and say i'm going to reach the pinnacle of what i naturally have as a gift i believe in that but i do not believe that john fosco can say in three years i'm going to start on the national league all-star team uh in major league baseball in center field you know yeah i i don't believe that just because you think about it a lot (laughs) No, I've actually never yeah. thought about that. <laughs> I'm just saying you got to know your yourself and, sure. and and what you're gifted with, I believe, and then go from there. What's your take? Yeah, I think that that's a great point. So self-awareness is something that's popping up a lot is that, okay, so obviously Conor McGregor knows he was meant to be a fighter. So now that he was in the UFC, then I believe those essential dreams, aspirations, knew they were he knew that he had the tools and that they were within reach and some would argue that the people that he's beating i mean most would argue that he's not even as good as them like from a skill standpoint i think you would be able to weigh in better on that than me but it's obvious and a lot of people talk about it right but there's that edge of a mentality that a lot of these guys are beat before they even walk in the cage against this guy jose aldo was a good example eddie alvarez alvarez just recently was a good example so that's a different edge So I think that once you're in your wheelhouse, like it's very similar to me. I knew fitness was my way. So then I was like, okay, now, you know, let's start throwing some things out there that I'm really going to go towards. And I think Connor's done the same thing. And Donald, when he had a shot and he thought he could really 
have a, have a chance to be the Republican nominee. I think he started doing the same thing. So I think like once you're self-aware in your, in your, in your house, then you go to that next level. I think if you just get up every day and you're like, I'm just going to visualize, I'm going to be this guy, but you've got no wheelhouse, you've got no work ethic, then you can visualize it all you want. It ain't going to happen. But once you're, the self-awareness is a huge, um, huge takeaway, John, I think. Yeah, without a doubt. So, okay, if, if we're using Connor as an example right now, the one thing that he, he's a very smart guy and I think people overlook how smart he is because of his yeah. shenanigans. But yeah. what he is, he is truly figured out, right? Put it like this, and I'm talking to the listeners here. If you see a guy who's five foot four, right? He's 120 pounds and he's soft, right? He's not made up of much. And he looks you dead in your eye, right? Dead in your eye. And he says, I will whoop your fucking ass inside out. There is something to be said, okay, about that. Because if that dude can look you dead in your eye, let's say you're a 200-pound guy and you're, and you're big, and he is so confident, you start to naturally, as a human being, question yourself. Like, what, yeah. what does this guy know that I don't? Because he... He shouldn't be that confident, but he is. So what Connor has stumbled upon, and, and I believe it's the most powerful thing, not only in sports, but in business and, and in life, is truly the power of the mind. So you can argue Connor is not as skilled as yeah. some of these other fighters, and his game is not as well-rounded, but he understands that if he plays that mental game to a T, he will partially defeat them even before they step into that cage. They will yeah. be hesitant. They will be off their game. And don't kid yourself. That is probably the biggest skill oh. in fighting. You know what I'm saying? Think about it, man. You're tired. By the end of that press conference tour with this guy, how tired are you listening? Like, Jose Aldo, I remember... He was so tired of hearing Conor McGregor yap. He wanted to knock him out so bad that his game plan went right out the window. Same thing with Eddie. They're just tired. I mean, when you have an emoji of yourself throwing monster cans, that's the number one app download. Like, he's just taking it to an entirely different level from his shenanigans. So I would argue that his shenanigans are part of the brilliance. Right? Because without you are, oh, without a doubt. So, same with Muhammad Ali. I'm so pretty. I'm the best. He said even before he was the best, he told everybody he was the best. And he but he was on the edge of being great. So he knew like that little bit would probably take him over the edge. And so people knew they were gonna walk in the ring with a guy that really got up every day and thought he was the greatest. And if you don't think you're the greatest, that dude's got an edge on you. And so that that confidence, like Connor said, he sat at the press conference and says I'm not surprised. He doesn't even have a scratch on him. I'm actually not surprised. I'm just glad it's a reality now because I saw it so clear. Like I, well, I right. knew he it would happen. He believes it. Yes. And, 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 and when, you, when you believe it and you have that confidence, it's like you just said, it's not a surprise. And as all these other guys, right, all these other guys, and, and if we're selling the Connor tip, I'll, I'll use this example. Yeah. They're all saying, oh, man, i got to get my takedown defense better. Oh, man, i I, I, I got to work on my chokes. i gotta, I got to work on my level changes. And he's sitting back laughing, saying, like, nobody is even smart enough to understand what I'm doing. No. Sure, he puts in the work physically. Of course he does. That's a given. But yeah. what he does is he makes you want to hurt him so bad that he knows and you know what you're going to do. And that is you're going to go after him and throw everything you got. And guys, if you've never sparred or if you've never fought, the worst thing you can do is throw at someone as hard as you can because you gas out, your arms feel like they weigh 500 pounds, you cannot move quickly, and then all of a sudden... Here's a famous statement, fatigue makes 
cowards of men. That is his strategy, yep. and nobody has stopped to take a look at it and figure out why this guy's doing what he's doing, and that's what makes him brilliant. I, I believe that here, – here's one thing I'm seeing. A guy like Eddie was all worked up because Connor was probably late on purpose – to the uh, to the pre- to the early presser or whatever, like before the fight, he walked off. He was I, I saw the interview. He was rambling on camera, like his adrenaline, and that was up way high, way prior to the fight. I honestly believe he can almost induce, essentially, some sort of an adrenaline dump too on these guys because they're they're height. It's like heightened the whole time dealing with him in the press. Because he's a rock right. star. It doesn't even he, – he said it – this was awesome. Now, I've actually done more research probably than you realize, John. I've been watching a lot of this stuff lately. It's like I don't watch the fights that often, <laughs> but I watch all this other stuff that's very intriguing. Yeah. He says, yeah. you know, when I walk in the cage, meaning Connor, I feel free. He goes, I feel like a right. monkey on all these press tours and all this stuff. They're telling me what to do. He goes, they're feeding me bananas. They're telling me what to do. I walk in the cage. It's all me. I really right. believe that that's like his place of calm. These other guys aren't used to all this pressure, right? So he's got them in a pressure cooker. Boom, boom, boom. Then they get to there, and I really think it induces that little bit of a drop-off. And then, yeah, their arms feel heavy. They feel slow. That's how Eddie looked and what I saw. And he's like Bruce Lee in that bitch, all precise, bang, right up on the chin, like picking his shots because they literally are slower. Well, I mean, yeah, it, it, you're, so not cool. only you're absolutely right about about the slower, but what he does is now he knows what the other guy is going to do, or he bets on it, and he bets right because he bets on human emotion. But he also knows what he's going to do. And if you look at the history, and this is, I guess, a little more technical to the sport, not probably nobody in the history of mixed martial arts has been able to gauge distance. Connor stays away from you, and when he comes in with that straight left that puts everybody down, if you look at his feet, he literally closes about two and a half to three feet of distance. So it's not just the extension of the punch. It's that his body is flying forward, and that's why if you look at his right hand, uh, he's, he's doing what I like to call talking on the phone, right? He ducks it like he's talking on the phone because he covers up because he's jumping in on you. And that guy gauges distance amazingly. And if you're moving slow and someone covers three feet in a half a second and then unloads a missile, dude, you're going down. And all that is is execution of plan. So that you could take that away with business or anything. So Connor has a plan, guys. He executes. He gets his opponent all riled up. He gets them to where they're so uncomfortable all the way up to the fight where they should be comfortable, which is inside the cage, they're still uncomfortable, and then he just precisely chops you up. And like Shell Sonnen says, he said this to Hannah Storm today, he goes, I'm a better wrestler than you, and she starts laughing, he goes, but if I can't get to you, I can't even show you that. Eddie Alvarez right. is a way better wrestler than Connor, but he couldn't get to him. Because well, he, no, he didn't, he, he, the beauty there, Corey, is yeah. he didn't even try to. Eddie yeah. didn't even try to wrestle, because guess what, Eddie can box too, and yeah. guess what feels better than taking someone down? Punching them in the face, especially when you're really mad at them. You're mad, and, yeah. And again, <laughs> like we talked about this before the fight. That's the one game plan that Eddie would definitely lose in if he boxed with Connor. So yeah. you, you'd have to be an idiot to do that. And that's what he did. So, and so that is not to take away from him. That's a pure uh-huh. credit to the mental puppetry of Conor McGregor and guys like kind of the theme of this show, guys who literally visualize what's going to happen and then make it happen. Well, what you can't do is let your opponent pull you in. I think they'll matter, and that doesn't matter whether you're doing a business deal, doesn't matter whether you're, you're working outside, like negotiating, you cannot let your yeah. opponent pull you in. Right, John? You, well, you're, you're one of you the best. Forget letting your opponent pull you in. You cannot let anyone else be in control of you ever. You must be in control of you always. And it doesn't matter if it's business, fighting, whatever. You control you. The second someone starts controlling you, whether it be in a relationship, which happens a lot, or anything else, you are fucked because you're not in control of you. So someone else is, you're going down. 
Yeah, I think that that's part of the entrepreneurial nature is being in control of yourself, right, John? I mean, that's that's probably one of the biggest things for me when I wake up every day. If, of course, there's partnerships, there's things that you're involved in that you have to come together for one common goal, but the fact that you put your own socks on and and no one's telling you to do that or you don't have to go a certain place or do is like you're in, in control of sinking or sailing your own ship. I love, I love that part of being an entrepreneur and that if you are running at that level and you allow somebody to dictate the way that your ship is going, then that's when you're just, you're at the, you know, you're at the mercy of someone else. And that's really, puppetry is a great word because that's oh, literally yeah, that's, what it is. That's, that's word. <laughs> and, and think about, think about this, right? What do we talk about that, uh, that you cannot operate with in business all the time? Fear. You cannot yeah. let fear enter into your thought process. Now, do you think Conor McGregor's opponents experience fear Absolutely. and pressure? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, 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 guys, here's the connection. Fear in life, if it influences decision-making, it is a loser every fucking time. Yep. Every time. So when you get fearful, just do me a favor. We're all humans, right? We all get fearful. Just Absolutely. don't make any decisions. Don't make any decisions. Or what Connor's learned to do is in those situations, he's, he's MJ. He's saying, when you're putting the, you're right next and o, X's and O's, I want the ball for the last shot. And the other guy's saying, uh, maybe you should give it to Pippen. Like, that's what I believe. Yeah, but happening. I don't think Connor's not fearful. Yeah, not at all. But I'm saying yeah. is he's thriving in those moments, which is like what right. all the greats do. Right. He's right. running towards the fire and the other guys are running away from the fire. Whether they know it or not, that's what he's put them in that mentality because they're, they're already beat before they get there. And so I think that that's one of the things that I've always kind of, you know, kind of back to the visualization real quick. The one thing that I can kind of identify with is, you know, um, one of the things I really, really visualized to a high level was being on the cover of magazines. And it was a really big deal for me just because, I really wanted to show my grandpa that I could pull it off. I, I thought it would separate me from all the other trainers in, in my area. I didn't realize the level of, you know, kind of credibility it would give me, um, you know, once the internet got bigger and all those type of things. But I visualized John to such a degree that it was almost at an eerie level. And so I can identify a little bit with Connor, what he said yesterday, because I literally visualized myself driving to Barnes and Nobles walking in the door, seeing it on the shelf, picking it up, buying it, like, I mean, to like a level that was so clear that when it actually happened, it felt like deja vu. Well, yeah, well, and, and you expect it, right? I, I believe Correct. anybody who, who's great has that, right? It's like going into, and, and you know this, it's like going into a big meeting. Like, yep. I know anything that they can possibly say to me, to possibly take our angle or whatever business I'm representing, the angle of that business, and make it look negative. I know every single thing that could be said because I visualized it, and there's no way you're going to get past me. There's no way you're going to get around me. Not because I'm lucky. It's because yeah. I visualized the moment and I'm prepared for it. And when it happens, dude, it's like going out to lunch. It's not. It's it's like it's it's another day. Well, and I've read so many books on this subject that it's not just the visualization and like, well, these guys said to do it, so I'm going to do it, right? It's trying to create a real feeling of what it's like. And the only way I can explain that is like. The joy in, the pr in how proud I felt to show it to my grandpa who, who taught me how to lift weights, to show that I took it to that level, the separation that I believe it created for me and the rest of my essential peers in my industry, like it was one more credential that I was really shooting for. The work ethic I knew I had to back it up, which is what we talked about earlier, is that wheelhouse. Now... Mind you, when I started this goal process of that particular thing, most guys on the cover of magazines were 220 and shredded, and I'm like 170. So I knew that there was a lot of hurdles to go through, but I'm telling you, when I picked that up, 
and I felt it, it felt the exact same way. And so if you have hmm. something that is, that's in your wheelhouse that's that important, you have to take it to that level because then once you expect it to happen, when Connor was sitting there with those two belts, that's why he said, and I listened to what John's taught me this, I listen a lot more intently to things than I used to, is he's just glad it's a reality because he already knew what it was going to feel like. He expected it. I knew exactly what he was talking about because I felt it before. Yep. And that, that yep. right there is like the next level thinking pattern, I, be, I believe, on your way to greatness. There's another thing that I've, I, thought, I think about constantly too is that, that literally I'm an old man and I've got my grandkids and they're old enough to figure out what I was able to do for them. I think about sure. that all the time. And I won't be able to experience that till I'm like 60 probably. But it's the right. fact that like I think hmm. about that, them saying to me, man, you were a crazy ass dude back in the day. And because of that, we're able to start this business or go to this school and that you set us up. Like that's real shit right there. And I think about it almost every day. And I always make fun about saying grandpa was a G, grandpa was a G. But that's the narrative I keep saying because that's what I keep thinking about. And whatever Alex's son or daughter is able to, to you know, articulate that back to me, I'll, I'll already know what it feels like. So guys, you, you got to like, this is like some, some out there type stuff to some people, but in reality, you're watching it happen in today's society on a huge level. It's happening. And, yeah, <laughs> and, and, here, and here, here's what I have to say. Like, a lot of people want to accomplish great things, right? They want, to, they, they, they want that spotlight of, of whatever industry they're in. But they don't understand that they're truly – and, and, and you can attest this, there truly has to be, and I'm serious when I say this, a borderline dysfunction yes. <laughs> when it comes to your, you, no, when it comes to your obsession yeah. to get there, right? I mean, anybody will tell you, I mean, Connor talks about it all the time. Like it is when you wake up in the morning, during the day, when you go to bed, it's your mind is on this goal and everything you do and everything you work towards is for this goal. It may be a four-month goal. It may be a four-year goal. It may be a fucking 40-year goal. Everyone is different. But guys, to think that you're going to accomplish great things and not literally sacrifice insanely and be yeah. obsessed. I know that sounds unhealthy, but, but we're just shooting straight. You have to be obsessed with achieving great things because great things are great. Yes. You don't just accomplish greatness and not be obsessed. No. Like, you got to put it in the work. It's not possible, John. I mean, that's, no. Just, no. that's just the realest thing ever. And you know what's so cool is that... Look, I've had a lot of people say that to me, like, dude, just take it easy, bro. Why are you, why, you know, you're already killing it. Like, why are you still eating tuna fish? Here's, here's the deal. I like the, what you said about the goals being four months or 40 years, because I can attest to that, that I have many goals that are events. Right now it's powerlifting. Before it was the muscle trifecta. I've done that for a decade. I go from event to event to event to event. And that's just what I do. It creates content. It creates, it creates goals, uh, immediate goals. It creates training hard. It, cre it allows me to get up every day and push for the overwhelming goal of being that grandpa that I just talked about. And so it's one of those things where you got to dial those things in, but I'm just as serious about that immediate goal to where when it's a couple weeks out, I'm dialed just like a fighter getting ready for a fight, just like this. There's no money on the line for me. It's all pure just pride, content, and excitement to get better in my craft. A true practitioner practices his craft till he can't no more. Like, that's what I love about Louis Simmons. He's, exactly. he's pissed at Louis. 70. Yeah, Louis pissed at 70 that he can't compete. Dude, I'm going to be the same way. That's one of the guys I look up to. He was still competing at 67. This dude right, right here will be the same way. It's just inside of me. Right, and, so it's, and it's, an, it's like, an obsession. I mean, yes. I can't turn it off. And I can't turn it off. You cannot turn it off. And guys, this isn't a uh, weightlifting exercise specific thing, right? Like if I flip that towards myself, for me, that obsession 
right? I don't, I don't know why I have this feeling in me, but I, I always have this feeling of I'm not secure enough, right? So I need to build my, uh, let's call it my castle, right? I need to build my empire. I need to stack more chips. I need to do this. I need to own more property. I need to own more stocks. I need to own more businesses. And that is, that is my obsession. That's why I don't have a family. That's why I am crazy to most people. Most people think I'm fucking out of my mind. And I probably am. But at the end of the <laughs> we day, both are. <laughs> yeah, it's an obsession because, honestly, I don't know why. It's just me. That's who I am. And I've learned with time, I ain't going to fight that because I won't win. I've embraced it. And the more I embrace who I am, the more successful I become. Oh, you got to embrace it, man. If not, it would eat you alive, John. Yeah. You just got to hone it in. What I, I got to say, though, for you, ever since we just even became partners, I mean, we've been going hard, man, business-wise, but I've also seen you try to take some relaxing time, which I think is made, making you better. It's making me better, too. Like, I feel like we've got a really healthy dose of both going on right now, in my opinion. I, 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 without a doubt, you definitely helped me with that. And it's funny because I was sitting um, on the battery, uh, the batteries in an area on the ocean um, mm -hmm. in Charleston, South Carolina. And I, I remember being nine years old, visiting this place and being like, oh, man, this is the coolest place in the world. And then I just stopped for a minute. I'm like, how did I get here? How did I get here? Right. Like I like I was a crazy kid who got in trouble who was a who was a drug addict, and then I uh, and then I found who I was, and and I'm an entrepreneur, and I'm a businessman, and now I am sitting here, living in a fantastic place right by the battery, you know, with my like, it it, it was just like whoa, like sometimes <laughs> you got to do that to yourself because guys who do go out and have an obsession, right? They never take the time to do that. And even though it was one minute, I literally took one minute of a quote unquote victory lap. Like mm -hmm. it, it hit me in a spot where I needed to feel that because it was like, dude, you worked for this. No sure. one gave you this. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and that just puts things in perspective. And all that does is it makes me want Monday to come even, even oh. faster. And yes. I want to accomplish more. That's it, man. John, when I go home, when I go home, um, I always drive by my trail. The trailer I grew up in is not there anymore. It fell down because it was like 1970. It was built in like 1970 or something. It was old whenever I lived there in the early 90s. I always go there, in uh, at least once or twice a year, and just park in the driveway because it's still the area. The the lot's still there. And you know, look, I it, I've always drove not brand new gently used 550s uh, Mercedes that's like my favorite car I've had like five or six of them even like I had older ones when I couldn't afford newer ones whatever so it's always usually what I'm driving at home and I sit that thing in the driveway not to show off just to like remind myself of like this is what it used to be this is what it right. is now this right. was the stuff I was visualizing like as I was driving away from that place in my four different color Dodge Omni packing up to go to Columbus to live this dream of being a famous, hopefully, trainer slash gym owner. I had no clue, you know, a guy that was going to be on the cover of magazines own a gym is what I told everybody to, to return it back there and say, all that dreaming, all that visualization, all that work ethic, all that shit work. was worth it. All that work was worth it. And, and that's why when I, I tell people, I love the, what people's face when I tell them I get up at 3 a.m. It's hilarious. Like, and that's just, that just been my jam, getting up early and doing these things for years. But when you sit there and, and I walk back to the end of the lot and I just look and go, yeah. wow, when I was in that place, this is right. what I was dreaming of. And it ain't about the money. It ain't about the car. It's about the contrast. Absolutely. It's about this was me. Now, no, the, the car doesn't define me, right? But, no. but this is where I, where I am now. It's a, it's a, it's a reflection. But, but you said something that um, is so important, I think, for everybody to understand. And uh, you, you said when, when you were going to Columbus or going to the city, um, you didn't know how. And no. I, I want to stress to our listeners, like, I have never in my life known how 
<laughs> I was going to fully execute on my goals or my visions of businesses. Like the how is the journey. Yes. And what makes you a business person or an entrepreneur is the ability to make critical decisions along that journey. But if you don't know exactly how to get there, guys, that's okay because nobody does. No one does. And you think, yeah, <laughs> and if you think you do know, you're, you're dead fucking wrong, okay? That's no. a fact because no one can predict the future. So do not not do something because you don't know every step of the way because life is about winding roads that take you down paths that you yeah. could never predict. Dude, come on. Listen, actually, this is a great segue because um, I read in Donald Trump's book, Think Like a Champion, I think it was called Think Like a Champion, how one of the chapters he just talked about straight up, you think you have this path all figured out. Everybody <laughs> does to some degree. Then right. you, it's just, like, it's just like when you're driving at your road and all of a sudden there's a detour that takes you on this big circle way outside around the way you really want to go. But then when yep. you come back, to the road you're supposed to be on, all the things you learn on the detour make you better. And then, and, and I believe this, that if I didn't take these certain detours and all these plans to get used to all these zeros, all these personalities, all these people, all these things that I had to shoulder and go through adversity, that I would be even ready for when I would run into half the stuff I ran into. Those you would, detours you would are what make you better. Hey, be soft, bro. Like that, that's what equips you to even be uh, hopefully great one day. You yes, have to yes. go through those, right? So, Dude, I call it the timeline life, man. Yes. Like don't live the timeline life of I'm married when I'm 25. I'm having the house when I'm 30. We're having kids when we're 32. Oh, wait, I haven't even met the girl yet. Bro, yeah. bro. It ain't about the age. It's about the person. It's about the quality. Get your fucking ass off the timeline and look at the quality, not only of people, but everything you do in life. Because the timeline life, right, the life where you walk down the road even when you know you got to turn right, but you said two years ago you were going to keep going straight, that's how you get fucked up, man. Oh, dude, that's exactly how – like. You cannot plan those things. And if you think you can, you're already losing. Like you can have an idea where you're going. But look, do you think Trump, when he, you know, was, uh, when he took over, I, all, I go all the way back to the USFL, when he took over the USFL and he thought he was going against the NFL, that it would go upside down? Do you think when he started out that he, when he'd go through the primaries that the Republican Party would then, even though he was popular, would, would try to basically overthrow his campaign? Do you think he, he envisioned that would happen? No. He was like, F these dudes. I'm taking it on. And then look what happened. He did the unthinkable. But that's the kind of things that you have. Those detours are going to come. You might as well expect them. Because if you don't expect it, them, I mean, they're going to happen. Me and John's went through stuff with our business. <laughs> And we just like, well, we expected something to happen. I mean, I just never expected to go smooth. You might as well be crazy. Yeah, never expected to go smooth. And the one thing I can say about Donald Trump, and, and I, so I, I was driving down King Street, which is, which is the most, uh, it's the busiest street here in uh, Charleston, and there was a huge protest. Cops everywhere yesterday uh, about Trump. I know there's protests going on in every city. Listen, first off, I want to say this. He, guys, it's over, okay? Like him or hate him, he's the next president. So no doubt. Um, it doesn't help to disturb the peace. You want to peacefully protest? That's your right, but it's over. Number two, I think what we all can learn from Donald Trump is this. I don't know of a more fierce warrior, I mean, warrior, like fighter than Donald Trump. He, I mean, he fights even when it's stupid to fight. But that dude, if you look at how he's gotten to where he's gotten, um, you know, they always ask the question in philosophy and in life and in business, is it better to be loved or is it better to be feared, right? And five different people will tell you five different answers, okay? But Donald Trump has people, and this is how he got where he got in politics, 
He has people fearing him so much that they will not speak out against him because they fear that if they hit him, he's going to hit them back 30 fucking times. And that's what he does. So for, for everyone who's trying to make their way out there in this world, mm-hmm. it's a mean world. It's a tough world. And no one gives a motherfuck about you except the people that, you know, your family and hope, you know, most of the time they do. But Donald Trump, what we can all learn from him is, dude, you got to fight sometimes. And sometimes oh. you got to fight more, more, more than you even know. But when you fight, let me tell you something. Throw that first punch. Don't throw the second one. Throw the first punch and finish with it. Okay? That's what he does. Okay? So. You know what's interesting, too, about his campaign is he was in states, John, that he, in theory, was supposed to lose. But what was he saying? Oh, we're going to win so big here. We're, We're projected to win so big. Like, do you think that it's almost like you have to be in crazy town sometimes? Because, I mean, that's where some of those things, even though maybe he knew something somebody else didn't because he, he was winning those states, but when he was standing at the podium saying those things, they yeah. weren't projected at all. No, so, they I mean, weren't. They, right? they were not. You're absolutely right. But the one thing I'll say about him, and I don't know if this was dumb luck or if this was measured, is he bet on, he bet his whole campaign on mm-hmm. the anger yeah. of the American people. And he kept his finger on that pulse for the whole camp. He just kept betting on the anger, the anger, the system's rigged. It's not fair unless you're a millionaire. But... And guys, I mean, the truth of the matter is, it doesn't matter what side you're on. Yeah. Uh, the political system in the United States has corroded severely. So what he tapped into is real. And he did not take his finger off it. So, Corey, when he says things like that, I think it's just, you know, I think it's Donald Trump's self-promotion. I don't know if he he believes it or not. But what he does know is that he's on something that's more powerful, and he proved it, in this country than anything else. And that's the anger of the American people. Yeah, so, because, you know, I'm probably a lot more of a lover than a fighter. John, I would say that's one thing I had a little problem with is that I don't like riling up all the anger, right? He, he definitely had his, that there's no question. That's how he won the, won the whole thing. I, I agree with you. And I think that what's interesting is when you, when you, pr- when you kind of, I don't say prey on certain things that you know, or you do antics like Connor does over time, you know, there's a percentage in, in Donald's favor, that percentage helped him win, right? And Connor, the thing that he, the things that he posts over time, he knows he's going to create hate, but he believes, I think, that that promotion is good promotion uh, no matter what, what kind it is. And Donald's got to be the same way because the amount of Donald TV Trump time, is the race master of the world. Correct. Exactly. So, it goes, and, so that's, and, and, that, that's my point. Like, just creating havoc when you're in these guys' positions is, is part of their game. And we all get sucked into it. Well, man, listen, if, if you're in the public eye, here's just a fact. And, and this is for people not, not, in, you know, not in private life, okay? But if you're in public life, mm-hmm. you know, love me or hate me, just have an opinion of me, right? That's yeah. how you get ratings. That's how people follow you. That's how people care. They must have an opinion. So if they ain't going to love you, trust me, hate is sometimes better because they pay closer attention and they watch your every move and they tune into your every show and they watch your every tweet, which are all metrics that help you and support you. But sure. people must have an opinion. There's not, if, Imagine if Conor McGregor didn't do the antics that he does. Imagine if he went out and just said what, the, what everyone else in the UFC, where I believe UFC fighters miss it the most. Well, I'm going to fight who Dana says to fight next. Do you yeah. think the dude would be making one twentieth of what he's making? And more importantly, do you think this sport would be climbing to the levels it's climbing to? Absolutely fucking not. And yeah. most people want to see him get knocked the fuck out, right? Yeah. Because they don't like him. Okay? Yeah. But love me or hate me, just have an opinion on me. But they still watch. 
because yep. they're hoping either way. It's so funny is, and I, John and I were talking about this off air before, I'm drawn to the cockiest motherfuckers in the history of all these sports and I believe that I like to feel I like to you know classify myself as a as a confident but humble person. But I'm drawn to the Deion Sanders, Muhammad Ali, Conor McGregor, and even Donald. And so it's interesting because I don't know why though. I, I think it's just it, I think I just love to see if they back it up. I think I pride myself on backing up what I say I'm going to do right, or rising right. to the occasion. Sure. I did a whole chapter in my book about that. I talk to my kids about that. Like, I believe that's a skill. And I believe confidence over time is built so you rise up to the occasion that I, I'm the guy that wants the ball. I'm the guy that wants to stand up in the boardroom. I'm the guy that when you, we, we went to CET or when I went to CET, both, like I hope he called for me to stand up. Like, I, I believe that I'm the guy. And so I think that I'm drawn, even though these guys are way cockier than me, but I, I love them. I, I can't well, get enough. Dude, I mean, if, yeah, I mean, if you look at metrics and you look at numbers, you know, most people, we don't know if they love them or hate them, but yeah. most people pay attention to them. So, you know, Conor McGregor, it's interesting, man. So I, I was at um, a, large, uh, a large bar last night, and people at certain points in the fight, even though it was, I don't know, six and a half minutes, they were rooting against him. Like when Eddie landed a combo, and then they were rooting for him, and then they were rooting against him, and then they were rooting for him. It's like because he's this new supernova, people can't figure out. I think they love – what they love about him is that he is a gamer, right? There's so few people nowadays who just back it up, man. Just back it up like a motherfucker. I'm going to do it this time and do it. I think that's what they love. And I think what they, what, what they can hate is, is all the smack talk, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. They're watching, right? Here's one of my favorite things I saw on social media is that two days before the fight, he was wearing, obviously his handle's notorious MMA. He loves Biggie Smalls, obviously. He was Gucci. wearing the, the ex- same sweater as Biggie from like 20 years ago, like He's just embodied that I am a G and like right. posting yeah. Gucci sandal. I mean, it's just the whole spectacle. I just can't get enough of. So Dude, the whole press <laughs> conference in Madison Square Garden was suck. Uh, I'm sorry, females listening, please plug your ears. Um, <laughs> suck my big Irish balls. I mean, yeah. that's all he was saying at the press conference where Sports Center was covering live, FS1 was covering live. I mean, the guy is is, yeah, he's embodied, uh, I'm a G, uh, and that's it. You know what I'm saying? So, so John, what's, um, so obviously a lot of our listeners, including us, are not near on that spectacle level. Like, what's, what's the takeaways for the business owner that's locally, that's trying to kill it, um, the online business, our own business? Like, wh- what can we learn from these two guys in particular in your mind? I think that'd be great. I, I think, um, so... We'll use Connor, right? Connor yep. knows he's a fighter. He knows he's a, uh, um, uh, a, a, a top level fighter. And he knows that he has the leverage to essentially fight whoever he wants because he sells more pay per views than anybody. Yep. Um, so everything he asks for, right? I want to fight Eddie Alvarez. It's realistic, right? It's not this pie in the sky bullshit. Okay. So if you're a business owner and um, you own a t shirt printing shop, um, let's say you're printing, I don't know how you do your numbers, but let's say you're printing 200,000 shirts a quarter. I think it's realistic to say, you know what? I want to be the quote unquote champion of t-shirt printing in my County. I'm going to print half a million shirts a quarter by hell or high water. And then yep. put together just like Connor does put together a strategy to do it because if you can make 200,000 t-shirts a quarter you can make half a million shirts a quarter how how you don't know you just you just well you need more clients well how do you get more clients maybe you need to hire more salespeople. maybe you need to pick up the phone more maybe you need to make more samples but guess what that's not my bit that's not my business that's yours and you like Connor like Donald 
figure it out. But you want to be great, right? You want to knock out the Eddie Alvarez. All right, let's move up from 200,000 shirts a quarter to 500,000, and you figure it out. What I like about that too, John, is you start knocking on those doors for those numbers, then you're going to be in the positions where you're in front of a CEO of a four or $5 million clothing company that's looking for a new partner that could get you that 200,000 more shirts, and then you've got to, quote, unquote, get inside the cage and deliver, right? Yep. It's yep. your turn to have the – like you have to put yourself in those positions to win, then expect to win when you get there. And like John said, no matter what they ask you, what they come at you with, you got the answer. That you right. that you that you're the winner. You're undoubtedly the champion. You you expect it. You're sitting there with the belt. But I think what you said is is key is that setting those goals, you're already in your wheelhouse, execute that plan and win, and it will happen if you do all those things. You have that chance in that one moment to knock it out of the park. That's what you do. No so, question. So I- I, I want to give one example on that, right? So you, let's say you own a t-shirt, pl- uh, uh, a printing place, and you're thinking to yourself, well, I can't handle the volume. So, so let me just give you just a real world example of these things happen. So let's say you go out and do what we just talked about. And someone says to you, wait a minute, you print 200,000 uh, uh, shirts a quarter. You're going to do half a million shirts. Do you have the equipment? And then you think to yourself, oh, shit, I don't have the equipment. Well, it's as simple as this. Oh, shit, I don't, I don't have the equipment. It's like waving the white flag of fucking huh. surrender in business. Here's your answer. Sir, right now we don't, but we're actually in the process of getting either a larger space, right, or getting two new machines. So handling your additional 300,000 shirts is a piece of cake. Just want to let you know that. And then you go figure out how you're going to pay for the machines. But yes. at the end of the day, you got the business, okay? It's your job as a business owner to figure out, right? This is what gamers do. They figure it out. They figure out how to win. And winning in that scenario is getting the machines and getting the contract for the 300,000 shirts. You just define the gamer. That, I mean, that's, that's what it is. And it's, sure. sol- it, it's solution-based all the time, scalability, delivering when it's time, and just all out crushing it. I mean... I love dealing with people that I can that I believe are gamers. And when you get to that yep. gamer level, you expect I expected every time I went into a big deal, every time I went into a big vendor to just knock it out of the park every time. Doesn't matter who I'm sitting with. And and John was the same way when he came in to see us. Same thing. He believed he'd come out of there with the deal, which changed his business. I believe when I went into big deals, it would change my business. I believe Right now, when John and I go into a boardroom, we're going to get it done every time. It, somebody's going to like one of us, one of us is going to be on, or both of us is going to be on. Either way, we're still killing it. <laughs> right. That's and what and you know spec. what? You're absolutely right, Corey. And, and sometimes you don't have to go and meet with people. Sometimes you launch a product. Sometimes you launch a brand like, like Max Effort Muscle. And guys, I'm going to be straight with you. This, is, this isn't a plug. Listen, not only do we have the best product, right, because we're, we're going to say that because we made it and we believe in it, right, but the numbers back it up. If you guys could see what we're doing with this brand, it is truly exceeding our expectations. And I guarantee Absolutely. you this, if the leaders of the supplement industry saw what we were doing, direct-to-consumer, we would have 50 fucking offers tomorrow to buy our company. But we Absolutely. ain't selling. No, having too much fun, Johnny. <laughs> that's a good it's thing. too that's much good... fun with these sacks, walking around yeah. with these sacks down to our fucking ankles. <laughs> I haven't saw that one on social media yet, but I did see the – I don't know if you saw. Uh, I know it was your birthday this weekend, John. By the way, happy birthday! Yeah, but thank you. My brain's a little scrambled. Yeah, <laughs> I had. Um, I posted the guy had this blank wall, his sacks hanging on his wall above his bed. It's all cockeyed, and he writes, "My wife's excited that I'm hanging my sack over my bed. She thought her decorating would look a little bit different than this in her mind." Oh, <laughs> like that's another thing. And your girl's gonna love your sack. I mean, I these, so are, these are beautiful sacks we made. No, it's unbelievable. But talk about course, real quickly. Wipe like your sack? Of course. 
Of course. <laughs> I mean, listen, the 15-year-old humor could go forever. That's why we made that hashtag, everybody. Every guy I told about fucking laughed his ass off, and every chick I told about it kind of looked at me kind of, kind of cockeyed, so I knew I was on to something. But here's the deal. If, they, if our business quadrupled tomorrow, we would, one, figure out a way to scale it. It's a, it's a solution that you have to come up with. I would love the challenge of that, and that's what happens in business when it grows and you're a gamer and you expect it. I expect that to happen at some point, faster probably than we even anticipated. Like John said, the business is killing it. We're excited about the opportunity. The customers are happy. The products are great. They taste good. The, uh, Let's the, say thank you to these guys because a absolutely. lot of these listeners are taking so oh, Thank you guys so much. We appreciate you guys so much. That's why you know I answer back every snap, every tweet, every Instagram. Like I just... We just love the support that you guys have given us has been unbelievable, and we believe that we're giving you guys quality products, unique marketing to back up that support and great customer service. So, look, we, we appreciate it. And that, that's just a good example of execution, telling people what you're going to do. Listen, what's so cool about business and biceps, guys, we talked about building this business, creating it, and we did it over all these episodes. You guys heard us referencing it. You're seeing it. Like, what other podcast that I'm aware of is actually building businesses from the ground up, talking about the process that you guys can actually see happening you, you, and actually see it happen? Like I pride myself that we're able to bring you through the process. If this thing was already $100 million and we're just chilling, it's not as cool as it is if you're seeing us build it. That's what you're here to learn, I right. think. Right, John? I mean, well, no, I mean, here's the thing, Core. Yeah. Again, the odds, and I'm going to give a shout out to uh, our boy Paul Pavlik. Right, that yeah, that Paul dude, Paul. that dude supported everything we've done. He's he's a great guy. He's a very smart guy. Um, very smart. And and he said uh, he said something. I don't know if it was on Snapchat or Instagram or whatever. And uh, basically, he said, "Man, eight months ago or six months ago, you guys said you were going to create the best brand experience." and product in this space and he's like you did and uh you know he's talking about us and um and 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 to think about saying that which is such a huge bold insanely yes. uh, epic statement and then having somebody outside right um mm -hmm. an impartial party affirm it um it just makes you feel really good about what you're doing and um, it just makes us want to keep going and, 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 and keep bringing you guys. Listen, you guys, man, what's, here, here's the coolest part, Cor, is when people order, man, like we get orders on Monday, we get an email on Tuesday. Oh, guys, uh, you know, thanks so much, but I just, I just can't, I'm not mad that it's not here. First off, you, you know, if you don't get order, overnight shipping, you're not going to get yeah. it Tuesday. I, I just, you know, it's going to make my week once I get it. And like, so like someone orders on Friday. Oh, man, if it shows up on Saturday delivery, my weekend, it's going to make my weekend. Like, wow, wow, we created something that literally affects people's weekend. Like, you have yeah. a good weekend if you got our delivery. Like, that's a whole different level, and, and, and we use the word humbled a lot on this show, but that is truly humbling. Like, yeah. like, dude, as a kid, and even as a man now, I collect art. That's my weakness. Like, I get so excited when I'm going to get a new piece of art, right? Like, that's mm -hmm. how some people are, a lot of people are feeling about this product, Corey, and, and, oh. and that is so rewarding. But part of it is, John, look, we said that blanket statement that you mentioned, that Paul mentioned, right? We're going to make yep. this brand experience. So how much pressure, and I, and I thrive in this, as do you, did you feel to live up to that while we were creating it? None. Early None. None. Yeah, I, I, I did because I felt like when we were first starting until we got obviously Max on board, our, our character, that we weren't meeting that. And so that's why I wasn't very confident. And then once we saw what it was really going to look like, then I was like, ah, now we're meeting the expectations. Yeah. So maybe you didn't feel I that. Knew I knew you together. That. I knew me and you together. Oh, right? yeah. I believe no in people. And me and you together, okay, I'll go in a foxhole with you any day, any day of the yeah. fucking week. No one's going to beat us, okay? Yeah. So you got to yeah. beat us. You can try all you want, whoever the fuck you are out there. Try. You'll yep. fucking lose. But at the end of the day, I knew that together we'd put out the best shit. Yeah, and we no did. No question. 
No, I agree. So that's part of, so that kind of ties in the whole episode. And I kind of forgot, I mean, I know that we said all kinds of stuff on the podcast, getting ready for this, but that statement's bold, especially, you know, me coming off of what I had just done, joining up with you that had been in fitness, but not directly in supplements, except for helping with marketing, you know, with multiple brands. So now it's like, you know, for us to say, hey, and we didn't even know what it was going to be called. We didn't know what the colors were to say, we're going to kill it. I, I just love that we had to rise up to that. And honestly, it's even exceeded my expectations. The brand is so cool and so different from what I came from. It was uh, it's very artistic, which lends to you know your background and what you really believe in. It has a lot of meaning for both of us. It's just real. And I had a guy when I was trick-or-treating come over to me and say, man, this one just feels different, man. I, I don't know how to explain it, but it just right. feels different. It's really cool. And I'm like, man, I appreciate that because that's – that's what we were going for. He's like, yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's really cool. It's cool watching the content. It's cool yeah. just seeing everything. And so anyway, yeah. so we appreciate the love. And that, that's so, a great Cor, I want to say one thing before we close. So, sure. so me and Cor hired, um, we hired someone who's essentially like, like our CFO. And yeah. she comes in and, uh, and, and she looks at the numbers. And uh, I'm not going to say she said this, but it, it was – this was the the reaction. The reaction was like like someone looking around saying like, "What the fuck's going on? What are you guys selling drugs or something? Like <laughs> like like how the yeah. fuck are you moving this much product, right? Yeah. So that was that was an awesome feeling because like there's a there is a accounting professional of twenty plus years like like kind of blinking Ooh. saying what what the fuck is going on? But here is the clincher. I set up multiple phone calls to meet with this person. Uh, which is a CFO level type person that we needed. She said one really important sentence that me and John both <laughs> jacked, jacked with her about, but is uh, what got her the deal. She oh, without said, a doubt. She said, I am an expert in X. And, t- and we both went, oh. She goes, I teach it. I live it. I do it. I'm an expert in it. And John goes, well, I didn't realize I was on the phone with that. Like basically, we, we were right to messing with her. But right? she didn't blink. Right? At all? She didn't blink. No. No at all, right? Very decisive and yes. precise. And I didn't even take the other phone calls. We didn't even take them. You know, we Corey, knew I, right I really there. like that you brought that up be, be, because awesome. what's great about that is this, right? So many people make the mistake in business of saying to a client, a potential client, well, what do you want? What are you looking for? Exactly. That's the worst thing ever. Like, we don't like, know. You, you, That's why we call you her. Got to the doctor prescription route, which is, I'm the pro yeah. in this vertical. Let me look at your business. This is what you need. Oh, Corey and John, you want to challenge me on accounting? Okay, motherfuckers, try yeah. it. So good. I'll make you look like idiots. And me and Corey are obviously smart enough to know that we're not CPAs. No. And if someone knows that kind of shit and is an expert, that's yeah. who we want on our team. And what I loved about it is when I met with her in town, she's awesome. It's, you know, mama three, uh, you know, very just low key. But when she was about her business, it impressed John and I both to where we, like I said, we kind of messed with her about it, but I loved it. And it clinched it. I literally didn't take, I was like, well, we found, we found her. <laughs> it was so good. Yeah. So yeah. when you're in that moment, so she was in a moment, she didn't even realize it. But she was in it, and that's just the way she operates, and she just knows she knows her stuff. So, you know, it was pretty it was pretty cool. So, if you know your stuff and you got a vision, everybody, believe you it. Execute. You got to believe in it. And you got to execute it. And uh, you know, sometimes some stuff you say might be outlandish at times, but you might just you if you if you can uphold to it, there can be greatness there. So, John, do you think John? Do you think the podcast can be stopped? <laughs> God, you beat me to it. I beat you to it. Ah, Podcast cannot be. Ah. Pull up to your spot on low, shine brighter than all of the cats that got on glow. Laying the cut like they not going no. Cause if I gotta make a move, dog, they not going no. This door more private, this is not for show. It's most deaf what you call real for show. Is they what you call gangster? Hell no. They get a little pinch and go snitch to the pole. They all talk fast and they all think slow. I'm most definite not think so.